Welcome to episode 23 of Inside Politics, for teens, by teens, where I explore the politics and issues impacting our generation. I'm your host, Christina Lee, and today I'm focusing on impact litigation and racist policing. For this, I've invited Nora Ahmed, Legal Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Louisiana. Nora, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Christina. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so let's jump right in. So for those of, um, for the viewers who are unfamiliar with your role, could you just give a brief overview of what you do? Sure, so the American Civil Liberties Union is a national organization that has affiliates in all states in the United States. And so in Louisiana, there is an ACLU affiliate. We of course have an executive director, but we have various departments. So we have an advocacy department, a development department, and a legal department. And I'm the legal director of our legal department. So that means that along with the rest of the legal team, and honestly with our advocacy team and our development team and our executive director, I help to steward the vision of the affiliates legal cases and help to make sure that what I recommend fits in with the larger vision of our specific affiliate. And our executive director is very intent on having the work of the Louisiana affiliate focus on racial justice. So what that means is all cases that we would seek to bring, whether they're a First Amendment case or a Fourth Amendment case, we want to make sure that we are cognizant of the racial justice element of those cases. Awesome. So how do you interact with policy as a part of your role? So at our affiliate and generally at affiliates nationwide, it's very important that we are not blind to what's going on on the policy front. And that's really why we have an entire advocacy department and they do a lot of community work to ensure that we are stewarding our vision so that it is in alignment with the needs of the community and those issues that have been raised by other nonprofit organizations. So that means that anything and everything that we do on the legal front is intended to build and buttress community power. So we're not looking to bring a case that doesn't do that. Now, the benefit of working for the ACLU is we are really trying to ensure that we are fighting for civil rights. But in the context of fighting for those civil rights, we wanna make sure that we're focused on the needs and wants of the community. And our advocacy department really helps ensure that we're aware of what those needs and wants are so that we're creating a program that is hopefully in tune with what the community needs and wants and isn't just an impact litigation case that we're bringing that the community doesn't necessarily see value in. Understood. So I understand that you're leading Justice Lab, which um, is putting racist policing on trial. Could you explain what you're doing with those efforts? Sure. So after George Floyd was killed, we started to see an overflow of comments and care by large law firms in this country and smaller law firms, but generally for-profit law firms that wanted to make statements and make it clear that they were not in alignment with what had happened, but also that they were willing to put their legal prowess and their resources on the line to try to do something new and different so that we could prevent the event that we saw. Now, what does that mean? Law firms on the for-profit side have been doing pro bono work for a very long time. And they have been working on impact cases that tend to manifest as class actions. So historically, and still today, there are cases that are going to be brought on behalf of numerous individuals who have faced a particular plight. And big law firms have been those who have provided a lot of assistance in getting those cases through to trial and ultimately across the finish line for settlement purposes as well. What we wanted to do was something a little bit different. We wanted to actually provide direct representation to those individuals who did not have access to direct representation. And what does that mean? 
So generally speaking, if an officer has used excessive force or has engaged in unconstitutional conduct, there is a civil remedy available. And that means that we're not talking about the criminal context. It means that an individual can go to court and say, my civil rights were violated. And separate and apart from what's going on in the criminal case, they want to make their own statement that what happened to them was unconstitutional. Now, there is a private bar that brings these types of cases, and they're called Section 1983 cases. But there are limits to what the private bar can do pro bono. So those cases that are not economical to bring, and that generally means those that don't result in severe physical maiming or death, tend not to be brought as frequently as the other cases. And there's just an understanding among the community that to get a lawyer, you need some money if you're not going to be part of a class action. So we wanted to encourage individuals who had had negative interactions with the police, which started, of course, coming to the fore on social media much more after George Floyd was killed. You started seeing a lot of people come on the internet and say, hey, I've experienced racialized policing and it manifests like this. It doesn't necessarily mean it has manifested in my death, but I as a parent live in fear every day that my child might not come back home safely. I as a child live in fear for my life that I am going to be suspected of having done something wrong. And we wanted to ensure that if those individuals were encountering unconstitutional conduct on the part of the police, that we would give them a means to actually litigate those issues. And why does that matter? It matters for accountability, right? So we don't just get to a situation where one day an officer wakes up and all of a sudden kills an individual, especially within the context of how George Floyd died, right? Minute after minute after minute, a different decision could have been made, but it was not made. And then, of course, we find out, well, Derek Chauvin had about 18 complaints that had been waged against him prior to that particular event. We're effectively trying to intercede around the time of the first complaint, the second complaint, the third complaint. So if there's accountability, even if it just means that someone is aware that they can be taken to court, that we are going to be less likely to arrive at the event that we saw happen with George Floyd. And the reason we're choosing this strategy is because the larger class action strategy, while it has done very good things in terms of transparency and a means of getting additional data and arguing for the need of body cameras, we're not yet seeing that change the conduct of individual officers on the street. So we are hoping that with Justice Lab, we can create a blueprint for how to hold individual officers accountable. And I think of two examples in this context. One, when we're driving down a highway, people tend to speed above the speed limit. But the minute they see a cop car who they know is there to catch individuals who are speeding, you see the entire traffic slow down, right? And why is that? That's because there's a visible accountability mechanism in place that people feel the need to follow the rules when they know they're being watched. That's what we want to do. We want to send the message that we're watching and we're watching out for unconstitutional conduct. It's very simple. You can have laws in place, but if they are not enforced, the laws don't really mean anything. So we have laws in place that say certain conduct is unconstitutional. And what we want to start to do is say, we're going to actually enforce the constitution when we see those events taking place. So there is a big bucket of this that's about accountability. But there's another very important bucket. And that has to do with the fact that litigation is not fun or nice for the people who bring it or for those against whom it is brought. So we also want to give people the option to tell their stories so that it can be shared with the community, so that there can be a public call for change, but we're not necessarily forcing people to go through the litigation process. 
So we have a second prong of Justice Lab that is really focused on storytelling. And we want individuals to be able to make the choice about whether they think a case is worthwhile litigating or if they'd rather share that story, sometimes anonymously because they're afraid of retaliation with the public. And there's something else to bear in mind. In the state of Louisiana, you have one year to bring a Section 1983 claim. That means that from the date the event happened, you need to make sure that you have gone to a lawyer, you've retained a lawyer, that lawyer has investigated the facts, has done all the legal research necessary to see what the clearly established law is in this context, right? Because qualified immunity is something that we have to think about. And then they ensure that they file a case timely. Now, the issue with one year really does go back to this notion of qualified immunity. To plead the best case possible, everyone has to, on your legal team needs to be aware of how your circumstance parallels and graphs onto other circumstances. And that takes time and that takes research. And that is very difficult to do overnight. But we have to understand that when someone has been traumatized, in any circumstance, but especially when you're also talking about by law enforcement and you fear nobody may believe you, it's not that easy to just wake up and go and find a lawyer. You have to get through a lot of emotional stuff. You have to accept what happened. You have to accept that someone might believe your version of events. Then you have to make a decision about who you can go to. And then you have to think, is my request to have my rights vindicated going to cost me money that I don't have? Oftentimes, that entire thought process takes more than a year. But we still want to hear those stories. We don't want to say that if you don't have the money and you didn't fall within that statute of limitations before Justice Lab was created, we don't want to hear from you. We do. But we want to make sure that we're doing something on the litigation front for accountability, but that we're also respecting the dignity of people's stories and not saying that they don't matter just because there's this one year statute of limitations. And on your policy question, Christina, we want to ensure that what we learn from Justice Lab can become also that other cycle of movement where we start to ask the legislature to increase the statute of limitations when it comes to Section 1983 cases. So you're not left in this situation in the state of Louisiana where you don't know where to go and to vindicate your rights. And we're hoping that if we show and develop a blueprint for how to bring these cases with the assistance of for-profit firms that have come on board in a way that is extraordinarily admirable, and if we show how to put together the storytelling piece which we started to describe on our website as well. And if we get the community involved, that we can start to see some change. And that community piece is very important to us, right? We're working to ensure that every law firm that brings a case is partnered with a community member. Because we think that in order for what we are doing with Justice Lab to fit in within the context of the bigger movement, we need to engage in community-based lawyering. And that means we need to be partnered with the community. And that doesn't mean local council in Louisiana. It means community members who have had interactions with the criminal justice system and have views and opinions about how particular cases fit within the larger scheme. And so we're trying to really make sure that we also have all those elements involved and are providing resources to individuals that might come to us who actually have need for assistance with addressing and assessing what happened to them. So right now we are looking to reach out to graduate schools to see if they would be willing to have their students offer mental health services at no cost if possible as part of their program to some of the folks who come to us. Because it's very difficult, as we all know, to process trauma. And a number of times there's a need for some assistance on that front. So we wanna make sure that Justice Lab is really 360, that it's not simply litigation, it's not simply storytelling, it's also community involvement and trying to ensure 
that there is a means to provide the affected community with resources to help deal with the trauma of these situations. That's amazing. So how would you say that this Justice Lab um, intersects with social movements like Black Lives Matter? I think we're working to make sure that they're directly integrated with social movements. So part of our training for our law firms, it's a two week training, it's 10 sessions, it's approximately 90 minutes each session. So we're talking about 15 hours of training. And in addition to substantive training, so what does it mean to bring a claim for First Amendment retaliatory arrest and equal protection? What does it mean to bring a Fourth Amendment claim and to look at qualified immunity? And we got you know, some of the best scholars, if not the very best scholars in the country to talk about these things. We had Dean Chimerinsky presenting. We had the University of Texas at Austin, their Supreme Court Clinic presenting on the merits. But we also are having community members present. So we are getting former public defenders who have worked in the area for more than a decade to provide a presentation. And then also we had Bruce Riley, who's the deputy director of VOTE, which is Voices of the Experience, present to our team on movement lawyering. So he represents a group and that has a number of members of individuals who are formerly incarcerated. And we want to make sure that there's an understanding that his constituency, in addition to a number of other groups in Louisiana that work with formerly incarcerated individuals, that their voices become part of this movement. So Black Lives Matter is heavily integrated into what we are doing. We don't want to forget who this movement is really driving and who it's for. And that, again, is one of the reasons we're very much focused as an affiliate on this concept of racial justice, right? We want to ensure that we are focused on the fact that Black Lives Matter. And we were at a protest on Friday in Baton Rouge, and I saw a sign that I thought was, you know, exemplified exactly what we're talking about here, which is all lives don't matter until Black Lives Matter. And we want to ensure that we are providing the representation for the folks who matter and that we are ensuring that their stories get told in court and outside of court. And we want the input of the community for how we can improve and how we can provide the necessary resources so that we move forward. So we are also going to protest that the NAACP is putting together with other local organizations like Village Keepers so that they know that we are in alignment with their mission and vision. And we're also working to align our legal mission and vision with the mission and vision of the folks on the ground. Understood. So how can teens get involved in this effort? So that is something that I have been focused on, you know, extraordinarily. Um, partially because I was a high school teacher in the South Bronx for a number of years. And so getting young people involved in doing what you were doing, Christina, I think is essential, right? Because we often are having conversations about what's best for, quote, our children, but our children are not at the table. So it's very important, as you're trying to do, to make sure that teens have a voice at the table. But then we as organizations that have a lot of adults in them, we need to be inviting teens to the table. So one thing that we're doing with Justice Lab in Louisiana is we're working with students that were a part of an advocacy institute to start to put together a training on children and policing for our law firms, because we wanna make sure that they are hearing from a significantly large constituency that's very much affected by racialized policing. But I'm also making an effort to bring on as many interns and externs as possible, generally for credit from their various institutions, um, so that they can learn about the work that we're doing and that they can assist in that process. So I am trying to make sure that everything that we're doing at the affiliate, there are a lot of issues of confidentiality, of course, so anyone who comes on board has to make sure that we're not violating legal privileges or we're sharing any of this information um, that could jeopardize the legal cases that we're bringing. But I want to ensure that if there are young people that want to get involved, 
that they email me and that they talk to me and I want to give them whatever platform would be helpful. So I am happy to speak to you. I'm happy to give young people a platform to speak to the adults who are really trying to use the resources that they have to propel this movement forward and any other thoughts and ideas that young people have for claiming a seat at the table and then trying to ensure on my part that I'm inviting them to a seat at the table. But I wanna be very clear that I want anyone to contact me and if they have ideas to tell me what those are so that they can be integrated. Because as much as we need teens at the table, I think what teens are often saying is, we know what the solutions are better than you all do. And I agree with that. So I would love it if teens started coming to me and giving me a number of their thoughts and ideas. And so, so far I have worked, since I've come on board with Justice Lab, I would say about 50 young people. And I'm happy to have more um, get on board because my view is that we are only really gonna make headway if we have youth involved. Because youth are not jaded. Youth are creative and they can think of solutions that adults just aren't thinking about. And that's why part of Justice Lab, just so we're clear on the appellate front, is really meant to focus on students that are working in legal clinics. Because if we're gonna be innovative and if we're really gonna change the way that the Supreme Court starts to think about some of these issues, I have the utmost respect for the senior practitioners who do this work, but I have so much hope and faith in young people and letting them break through with creative solutions. So I think it's about being open. And if there's any message I want to send, it's that I'm open to those thoughts and ideas because it can only make us better. Okay, that's an awesome call to action, and I think that's a great place to end. So I think, thank you so much, Nora, for joining me today. I really appreciate your insights and thoughts. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see everyone next time on Inside Politics. Hi, everyone. This is Christina. Thank you so much for watching Inside Politics, and please feel free to check out the rest of the interviews on my channel. See you next time.